as usual, we have Brooklyn in the building today. The amazingly talented and lovely Andrea Pitta for you all. Founder and creator of one of the most renowned bridal companies, Pantora Bridal. Also the founder of Trap Fabric. And I almost forgot to mention, but we also have the Pantora Ready to Wear line, Pantora Mini. I mean, one of my A jobs is being a wedding photographer, so I'm super excited. I know Dope's excited. Welcome, Andrea Pitta. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay, now we know Pantora Bridal Flagship Store is in the heart of Brooklyn, where you were also born and raised in Brooklyn. I'm from Crown Heights. I've been there yes. forever. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Quickly, we love Black business owners. So what does it mean to you to be a Black business owner? Honestly, being a Black business owner means representation, especially mm -hmm. in my community. What's been really, really important for my journey has been able, been me allowing my community to kind of see the growth that we've made. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that we're still in Brooklyn and we haven't kind of um, left to run to Manhattan, but it's really um, allowing people to see our growth and trying to not necessarily be an inspiration, but definitely to be a form of representation. Is it down to, it, it does it have to be in terms of the faith? Or is it also being the provider or having the back end, you know, in terms of, okay, you have your bridal store, you're making sure you're reaching out to designers that are black owned. Is there a difference between those two or are you just mainly about, okay, the face of this brand of this business has to be black? No, you know, what's funny. I didn't love being the face of this business for a, for a period of time. I kind of hid my face. Like, I just oh. was like, I don't want, I don't want people to want know to be seen. Me. No, I just wanted to do good work. And I think sometimes you get caught up in like the popularity of it all or like mm -hmm. the hype of it all. And I honestly just love the work that I do. And at one point I was like, this will be a distraction and I need to just kind of phase all of that out and just ground myself in the work that I wanted to do. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to commit myself to that. But um, being like the face of it, I think it's important so people can see who's behind the work, but it's not just my face. My team is full of Black women. They're amazing. Um, yeah. My brides are Black. <laughs> Very yeah. much so. Um, I built a business to cater to Black women. And so I think um, just overall, it's very well-roundedly Black, out outstandingly Black. <laughs> you know, I love it. But no, we, we definitely want to understand the journey. And with that said, in regards to becoming an entrepreneur, I read that you were like super inspired around the time you were 12, then you started a business in high school. And for myself, I even always showed signs of being an entrepreneur and just being entrepreneurial. But how does one actually see so far ahead that you literally decide to start a business during high school? I am exceptionally headstrong. Um, when I was 12, I wanted to go to the high school of fashion industry and I am Caribbean raised. My parents are Jamaican. And like the concept of that was, was not okay. Like it was so frowned upon. And my mom was just like, be a nurse, be a doctor, be a lawyer. And yeah, I, yeah it was, we know, we know, we know that well, <laughs> we know, we, we know that struggle well as West Indians. And you, I think the hard part about that is that I was normally good at the things that I did. And so my mom was like, well, you can be a nurse because you're so good with people and you can be a teacher because you love children. So that got really, really difficult because she saw that I could probably go on any career path, but it was really the one that mm -hmm. I wanted. And um, there was a, a high school called High School of Fashion Industries. I wanted to go there. There were uh, specialized high schools at the time, you know, Brooklyn Tech, Stuyvesant High School, those right. schools. Um, I went there to take that test and halfway through I realized I was going to get in and I was like okay we're going to Charlie out the rest because we're not going here <laughs> <laughs> I sabotaged it and I felt so guilty because when I tell you I was one of those children who while headstrong and like I, I did not hold my tongue I never did anything bad <laughs> so like that was probably the worst thing I had done at the time and my mom asked me like how did how did you do and I just said, I did my best. I don't think I told my mom that I intentionally failed that test until I was damn near 30. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. First generation American kids of West Indian. We be living with some guilt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we be living with like crazy. I did this and I didn't want to tell you like, 
and we don't get the courage to speak on it until we're like really grown adults with our own homes, families. Like, oh, well, let me just slide this on in here. It's always How a slide in it? there. <laughs> it's always a slide. You always have to test the water with these Caribbean parents. You can't just boldfacedly be yeah. like, by the way. <laughs> yeah, just for anybody who doesn't know, that are, that is listening, who doesn't know, FIT is the school, if you're in fashion, you want to get into fashion, FIT is the Howard University. <laughs> of I fashion love, school. I love the comparison. So many people yeah, yeah. think I went to Howard because my sister did, but I'm just like, I went to the Howard of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I did. So, so with that being said, like, what was it like to get into FIT and not only get in, but be there and be learning at that school and knowing, okay, I'm, I'm at the place where I want to be. So I remember the day I went to take the admission exam for um, FIT. I I had worked on my portfolio at the high school of fashion industries that entire four years. Like I knew where I was going. Um, the admissions exam was in person. You had to prepare a portfolio and then you go in and you almost do an interview style. And I remember them calling my name and the way I hopped out that seat, I feel like the lady gave, admitted me just off of enthusiasm. <laughs> like I just knew that I was in, but I didn't get an acceptance letter until I had already uh, told another school that I was coming because oh, they wow. gave me a full ride on um, Marymount, Mount Mary. It's in Wisconsin. They gave me a full, full scholarship. Um, they, they gave me money to fly back home, back and forth. If I needed to, you know, during the middle of the semester, whatever the case is, they gave me money for books. They gave me every money for anything that I would touch. And I was like, I guess that's where I'm going because FIT didn't accept me. I literally got my acceptance letter in May, like right before graduation. And wow. I was like, thank God, <laughs> because wow. I did not want to go to Wisconsin. You said your parents definitely, you know, they were, you know, there was concern at home when you were choosing the high schools, right? You chose fashion in high school and you clearly committed to it in college. So now at that point, how much more angry was everyone at home? Or at this point, did they kind of accept that this is your path? This is what you want to do. So we're going to support. Like, how did that go? You know what? My mom kind of, she got on board fairly fast for, for a whole full-fledged Jamaican parent. Um, she got on board around 16 when I started my business and I started to make money and didn't need anything from her. So <laughs> once, mm -hmm. once it was to her uh, benefit, it was like, okay, well, you know, she'll be fine. So, <laughs> you know, I started my business when I was 16 and um, I wasn't charging much, but I was charging enough where honestly, like, I didn't need an allowance. I didn't need clothes money. Right. I didn't need anything. And so, um, you know, I just needed a shelter and support. And my mom, although she did not want me to be a fashion designer because all that she could create out of that type of job was the Tommy Hill figures and the Calvin Klein. She didn't understand that there's so many uh, areas in fashion design that you could work in, textile design, pattern making. There was just so mm -hmm. much that you could kind of choose from. But, you know, to someone who's not in that field, it's just like, well, you're either the the head honcho or you're not. Right. And, um, you know, once she got a better idea of where I was headed, I didn't know that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It just kind of fell in my lap. Um, I just knew that I wanted to be a designer. But I think once my mom realized like how headstrong I am and that like I will succeed by any means necessary, it was kind of like you either could support her or let her hate you. Like <laughs> you do either. Wait, so you you said you started at 16 and making money by 16. She eased up a little bit. Did you get your LLC and tax ID at 16? Or? No, I got those at 18. Yeah. So um, I, at, at, I'm sorry. I, for those who can't see, I made a face. Like, wow. <laughs> um, that's what's up. So, to you. <laughs> I mean, that was interesting because I didn't actually fully know like what it meant to form a business. And so I actually was a sole proprietor first. That's what I got at 18. I got my business certificate and my license to do all the things that oh. I was doing. And then I turned my business into an LLC. Then I turned it into a corporation. So there was like different phases of how we got to this point. But, um, you know, one of the reasons I didn't want to turn my business official at 16 is because I only wanted my name on said business. And it, I, I was under the understanding that like your parents name would have to be attached to it. Not that that was like an issue, but if it was mine, it was going to be all the way mine. So, you know, I just kind of held off and did everything when I could and when I was very legal to do so. 
and it worked out thank god <laughs> and i mean at 16 i'm assuming you weren't selling the same thing now were you in bridal at 16 or were you doing something different um, I was doing anything that paid me. So <laughs> I was doing Fair prom enough. dresses, prom dresses, uh, sweet nice. sixteen. So I started my business off of sweet sixteen dresses. One of my um friends in high school ordered, you know how you have the court, you have eight girls, eight boys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she ordered eight dresses from me and I did those. And I was just like, hold up. Somebody just paid me like a stack. Like, I, I, I feel like it wasn't that much money now, but I remember it feeling like a whole lot, a lot of money. Of money. <laughs> a lot of money. And, you know, they gave it to me all at once, too. So that wasn't helpful. <laughs> <laughs> did you Hold on. Did you go out and buy Jordans or something? You know, I, I'm going to tell you, I was really honestly kind of dorky at 16. I was trying to figure mm -hmm. my way through things. So like Jordans weren't at the top of my list. I went out and bought more fabric, bought a machine, like another sewing Look at machine. That. Nice. Yeah. I, I would have bought Jordans. I, I would have bought three pairs at least. Yeah, we know, you know? We know you would. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes I wish I was cooler, but I just wasn't that cool. And like I spent my days on 35th and 36th Street going to the fabric stores, begging for fabric for free or for a dollar. And like it's just how my money was spent was, was probably not that of a 16 year old. Smart girl. Smart girl. It, 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 yeah, it, it doesn't matter. That's I mean, essentially, you're you're doing what business owners should be doing. So, yeah. yeah. But, you know, one of the beautiful things about uh, your journey or any journey for that matter is the people that you meet. So by starting a business so young, were you able to employ like the people around you? Like, okay, mom sees what's going on and she's like, okay, let me help you with what you need help with. What, was it a situation like that? No, my first employee, my first real employee was this woman. She showed up at my house and she did not take me seriously whatsoever until like she realized that I had customers coming in left and right. And she was like, okay, well, I got to buckle down. And um, she had to go on vacation and she never came back, but she was with me, with me for a while, left, never came back, ended up hiring another person. Um, I worked corporate. When I graduated college, I went straight into a corporate position as a designer for several companies. And one of the people I hired for one of those companies ended up working for me. Um, they worked for me for seven, seven years or so. Um, seamstress work. But the first time like I felt like I really hired someone was when I hired my best friend, um, Kristen, who, funny enough, in high school, she asked me what I wanted to do by the time I turned 25. And um, in that newspaper article that she interviewed me for, it said that I wanted to open up a bridal store. And the day that I opened the store, she carried that article. She's like, you did it. You oh, did it. You wow. did it. It, it, was, it was so special. But she was like the first person that I, I hired off of necessity and for quality of life for myself. Um, mm. And I was really, I was really proud of that hire specifically. Explain that. What you mean by that? I was doing so much. Like when you're an entrepreneur, especially in the, the starting phase and the, the part where you're trying to get things together, because at 16 to 23, God knows what I was doing. Like I was running a business, but I wasn't running, you know, it, it wasn't done well <laughs> by any means. Mm -hmm. And um, around the time I was 23, 24, I realized like I needed, I needed legitimate help. I needed someone who was going to answer the phones, who was going to respond to emails, someone who would take some of the burden off of me because it, it began to take away the joy out of what I was doing. And I knew that if I was going to be able to show up every day, that I couldn't be accountable for everything. And, you know, she was able to take some of that off of my plate. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. I can't wrap my head around finishing college and then going into a business where I'm turning it into something that's brick and mortar. So obviously you had a head start by just getting into the business and making sales at 16 and you learned so much in college, you made the connections. Um, was there anything else that kind of prepared you for that moment where you're going to say, boom, I'm going to open a store. I've been planning this forever. Was there anything else that we're missing? That was that glue. I wasn't even planning to open this store forever. I literally quit my job and said, I better figure out something fast. Mm. <laughs> so, wow. And that was when I was just like, okay, I, I quit my job in March. I started looking for a store maybe in June. I had enough money and enough clients to kind of see my way through March to June. And I was doing like pop-up shops and, you know, making clothes Monday through Friday and selling them Sunday, um, Saturday through Sunday. And, you know, I just tried to save up as much money as possible to figure out something. And then that something ended up me being, um, 
like in the neighborhood, I saw a store that was for lease and I ended up calling and, you know, that's where we ended up, but it was off of $4,000 cash and a $4,000 loan. And so I didn't have much. I thought $4,000 was a whole lot of money at the time. So, okay. How did, how, okay. Give me, give me like a little rundown of like, okay, first three to six months, you got this four grand. Like how did that transpire? <laughs> The four grand wasn't even there by the time I opened the store because you had to give up three oh. months of it to get to get the store. Mm. You needed the security mm. deposit right. in the first month and last month. So by the time I opened the store, that that four grand was gone. Then I needed to actually renovate the store because it doesn't come finished. And mm -hmm. right. so, you know, I went to Ikea. We went to the as is section and I reposted some chairs I found. It had my boyfriend, who's my now husband at the time, spray paint and legs. And we're we're hanging on $79 chandeliers in the bathroom and just trying to make something look good. And at the time I was just like, we're minimalist. That's what we are. That's what we are. I am not a minimalist yeah. by any means. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were. It was broke minimalism. <laughs> That's what it really is. Broke minimalism. And you're a minimalist because you have no choice. <laughs> right. Make but, it work. Um, we made it work. And, um, you know, the week that we were going to open, I had a friend scrubbing toilets. I had another friend, you know, steaming dresses and cleaning windows. And it was a ride for sure. My money was spent well before I ever got there. Um, I honestly, I'm trying to remember how I even made it through that first month because those first six months were hard. <laughs> And my mom was slipping me money on the side mm. just to like, mm. like she would yeah. make sure she didn't ask if I needed it because I would always say no. And like, I will always make a way. Yeah. I remember like, I know how my mom is and she didn't want me to have to force away. So she would be like, you need this? Don't pay your rent. And my mom is not like, um, what is it called? Silver spoon kind of parent. I lived at right. home and paid rent. So it was like, okay, um, by the way, something happened in the house. So don't pay this much rent this, this month. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, nothing happened, but you know what? I'll take right. you up on your offer. <laughs> 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 but, you know, um, I, I was really supported. And I think that's, you know, unfortunately what's missing in some entrepreneurs' life and journey is that they're not necessarily as supported as I was. But I had friends who showed yeah. up for me. I had family that showed up for me. And I think at that, that six-month mark, um, we were getting enough orders to cover expenses, but I wasn't getting, I didn't start getting paid for quite some time, but um, I wasn't getting paid. A lot of things weren't being paid for, like things that were needed. They went on my credit card. Um, and I like, you know, I understood finances, but not necessarily everything about business. And the more I learned, the better I positioned myself. Mm -hmm. um, that six month, we had a bridal party walk in their appointment said about 13 bridesmaids and we were just like well who has 13 bridesmaids in their bridal party like why would you even do that to yourself and we were like don't worry they're not going to all show up I was there on a Saturday by myself and about six women walked in and I was like wow impressive she got six out of the 13 girls here I blinked and there were about 15 people in my store and I'm like who are all these people um... I turned around there were 32 people in my store and 27 of them bought dresses wow I remember calling the two appointments I had after that appointment to ask them, can you please come back later? Because I had exerted every bit of energy that I had on that on that appointment. But I really needed the time to cry <laughs> because I was just like, I will figure this out. Because, you know, I, I never thought that I couldn't handle it, but I didn't always know how I was going to make it through. And that particular day, all of these people had given me their deposits. We're talking about 27 dresses. I don't really remember how much these dresses cost, but let's say, let's say they were $300, right? Each. Let's say we're three, three or $400 yeah. each. Um, we're talking like enough to pay my rent twice. And I was just like, come on, God. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I, I probably yeah. spent so much time on my knees because I honestly was like, this is hard, much harder than I thought it was going to be. And then here came these people who kind of just changed my outlook. And I was like, we're going to be fine. And we were fine ever since. Like after that day, we were fine. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Shout out to that bride. Right? Because clearly she don't play. Mm -mm. <laughs> Everybody came with the deposit that she don't play. Everybody Shout came with the her. And they were probably like <laughs> the least complicated bridal group that we ever encountered with 20s I never wanted to see the color red again after that group you know like I <laughs> <laughs> it was awful it was so awful but um the dresses were beautiful the people were beautiful and like just knowing that you know God provides and you know I'm 
I'm like over here, like God, this, God, that. But honestly, like in that, in that space, I really was just like, you know, if you do the work, people will show up. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, with you telling the story of that situation and telling the story of the first six months, uh, how you made it through, obviously, you know, there's, there's stress that comes with the territory. So I'm very much about self-care. So what, what, what does your self-care routine look like? Oh, I didn't discover self-care until maybe a year ago. I, I, <sighs> yeah. I have been running myself ragged. <laughs> oh, for Girl, I will shut down life for self-care. Like I, I, I realized so long ago it's so important, but like, what, what do you do? Like, what do you have? Like a little ritual routine? I enjoy my bubble baths. Um, I enjoy my books. I just like mm-hmm. my time to myself. I have like these single single woman habits, <laughs> like the things that you do when you think your partner's not looking or if they don't exist. So like I do my like dancing in the house naked, if like nobody's home. And I really <laughs> enjoy my own company. And I, I, I've learned that like just kind of enjoying myself is self-care. And I don't know that I ever spent the time to even really figure out who I am. And so like this whole, the last two years has been a very interesting journey because I so closely identified who I am with what I do that I had to actually take the time and say, you are not your business. You are like, that's not who you are. That's what you mm-hmm. do, but that's not who you, who are. you are. Yeah. yeah. And True. I think self-care has been therapy. Like therapy has probably been the best thing for me. And um, it's, it's allowed me to kind of be a little bit more self-indulgent. So with the level of success that you have accomplished, what's next on the agenda? Are we looking forward to a storefront to house trap fabric? Are we looking to, you know, expand on Pantora? Like what, what's, what's the next, I want to say two years looking like for you in terms of expansion? Two years is interesting. Um, I always feel like I make these big decisions and then like we're bursting at the seam the minute I, I do it. We we went from a 400 square foot space to 3000 square foot space and we already need more space. And I'm just like, well, where are we going to find more space in Brooklyn? Because they don't really get much bigger than that. Yeah. Um, but I want to open more stores throughout the country. We, we currently do like national tour stops. So we do these like visits. Um, but honestly, I'm, I'm, excited to kind of enjoy the fruits of my labor and by no means does that mean like not keeping my foot on the gas but honestly like I don't know that I've taken the time to step back and go look what you created and Mm. so the next year or so I'm gonna really really kind of apply the pressure on other people doing their job and kind of enjoying the things that I have done. Cause I've been going for half of my life. I'm, I'm about to be 32. So I've been doing this for 16 years with no stop. I don't uh, wow. have pictures of me like in the club, my, maybe like one or two, but I, I don't have pictures of me hanging out in the club. I don't have these memories with my friends, like doing the things that teenagers do. And so like, I really am just like, well, I don't want to keep missing out in the way that I have. And I don't have any regrets, but I really think that the next year I'm going to just figure out how to enjoy the fruits of, of my labor just more. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. But for trap fabrics, um, <laughs> I love me some trap fabrics, but we're going to, um, we're, we're looking for a storefront right now. We opened with the storefront, but due to COVID, we ended up closing it because people couldn't come. They just couldn't come to the store and our online sales skyrocketed mm. and our in-store sales were non-existent. So we pivoted and we, we went straight e-commerce, which has actually been amazing. But um, I definitely, I, I love the idea of having a place for people to visit. It's just, I, I'm a, I'm very much in a roundaway girl. I'm all about community. I like seeing right. people and that's the reason I want a storefront. I don't know that it's necessarily beneficial to my business at all, but, um, but it, it's the, a part of the thing that I love. I like my neighborhood to kind of see things. I like us to congregate. And um, yeah. so if I can, if I can find a space that feels like the trap, I'll reopen it. Mm. <laughs> it's almost like those teenage years you were speaking about, you might have not been hanging out with your friends as much, but you were in the garment district looking for these fabrics. And now you, you you're bringing that to people. Yeah. I mean, I did the thing that I enjoyed, so I don't really have regrets. It's not like I go back and I go, I wish I was in the club doing this and that, but I definitely don't have the average experience. Like I just don't like most of my years were working and I have friends who like reach out to me now that they're like, you know, look, all of that was worth it. Look. And I'm just like, you know, I feel that (laughs) I do. (laughs) There's so much stuff that like, 
my husband will be like, you don't know this, you don't know that. I'm like, first of all, I, ba- I basically only dated you. So, <laughs> like, like so much don't stuff. judge me, sir. <laughs> like, you were supposed to be the one teaching me. If that's the case. <laughs> it's, it's just so interesting. Yeah, and especially like, you know, living with someone who has who grew up very differently than me. My husband had like his years of fun and I'm just like, my fun was like on 35th Street buying swatches. <laughs> 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 35th and 8th I, I know I know what you're talking about exactly. I know what you're talking about like my seventh first, and eighth. It, my first date was at a um, Charles James fashion exhibit like that's <laughs> 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 listen and it brought you to this point of success and knowing your value and your worth and now you're you're taking that time out I mean not everybody goes the the normal quote-unquote route yeah. It, it, we, we all have our own journeys and then it gets it, it miraculously gets us to the same point yeah so, we get where we need to be for sure absolutely so dress, wedding dresses is how it all started so let's have a little girl chat blues here but he whatever <laughs> 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 so tell us tell us we, we want to know andrea first so tell us you know you're married mm-hmm. who is he and I mean, you gave a little backstory of how your husband has supported the brand, but like, how, just give us a little more, like how, how did it trans transcribe from boyfriend to husband throughout all of this? Honestly, I'm, I was trying to have a hot girl summer when I met my husband. Cause I, I didn't, I didn't have one. So I, like, I never had I never, like dated and stuff like that. So it didn't happen. It did. Yeah. It didn't happen. I happened. I had a very lukewarm summer that year, but, um, but <laughs> Uh, you know, he came in and he was supportive off that. Um, my husband is very much a take me as I am kind of individual. And we are mm-hmm. so very different. He's very quiet. Um, but he was always like there driving me places, picking up stuff, um, painting, like just anything that I needed help with. He was generally around. Um, I think that it takes a very, very strong person, not just a strong man to kind of be with someone like me because I need things to be a certain way. And my husband is very supportive in making sure that I'm happy, which is really, really nice because um, I don't know that I take the time to make sure that like I'm happy on my own. And so he's just like, you know, making sure that like things are where where I need them to be. Groceries are in in the house. Like I might have to cook these things because he's not a good cook well <laughs> the groceries are, <laughs> the groceries are always home if if I even make a mention of like this needs to be done I don't have to ask and it's just mm-hmm. very nice to just know that things will be done and that I'll be supported and you know if I need to cry that there's no judgment if I you know if I need to talk about business that he'll listen if I need to talk about like what's happening with us he's there and so it's just really nice yeah. to have a very supportive partner who's not like uh kind of playing into these gender roles that you know society yeah. has and it's just it's just very very nice just a, a little time frame when did you guys meet what year was this i met my husband in 2010 <laughs> 2010 oh, okay yeah so, so we talking yeah yeah we've been together for a very very long a very long time yeah and and a long so now, journey that has transpired with that. Okay, for sure, for sure. I am. Um, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful, yeah. and I'm sure he would say the same. <laughs> now, for your actual wedding day, did you wear a Pantora bridal exclusive? First of all, wore three. Oh, there we go. There we go. I wore three. Um, I'm my we- now. my wedding dress was uh important corded lace with 200 yards of tool a 16 foot train mm. it was like come on cool. come on Love my wedding dress and, and then I changed into a mermaid gown that we legitimately finished before we left to go to the venue <laughs> and um mm. my party dress was like a beaded winged gown and you know they all just felt like me at the time and um yeah, I'm I'm happy to have worn my dresses and to have been in a place that like I could I, I felt very confident in what I was creating that I would be happy to wear it. And I also think that like my wedding day was almost like a turn in my business as well. So much things nice. had happened. It was like the my husband proposed in front of 200 wedding professionals 
at a wedding conference and like there were just a lot of eyes and I I didn't want them at the time but it was actually good for business but (laughs) but uh you know there was just so much around the wedding it was like the the designer gets married which was the hashtag and I was like this is too much this is just too much I'm gonna wear a slip (laughs) dress the branding (laughs) oh my gosh I love it it was a lot of pressure and at one point like I was just like I'm gonna wear a slip dress this is too much pressure I don't want people to feel like I have to be the you know princess Diana of it all and um, I'm very happy that I made the decision that I made to wear the thing that I felt most happy in and I'm a showgirl by all means like I will wear a, a fully feathered gown and so you know wearing a slip dress would not have been the right choice for me but it it almost felt like that's what I needed to do to get the pressure off but I'm I'm happy that I stayed true to myself it was a, a beautiful wedding dress and a beautiful day period so what are your thoughts on marriage now and like what and the value that it holds within the community because we, we hear stories of people you know getting married, divorce. And I know you, as especially seeing couples come in, seeing brides come in and sharing their stories with you while they're looking for their, their, the perfect gown. Um, I would think that maybe your perspective would be a little different. So what are your thoughts on marriage? My thoughts now? have changed since being married before I felt like married marriage was like the way to go and the only way to go. But I think I'm just so much more pro love and pro commitment. Now, mm-hmm. I think marriage is nice if the two people want to be married, but I feel like if they don't, society shouldn't pressure them to, you know, to do it. But um, I love the idea of marriage. I love the idea of commitment. I think that the formality of it all is nice. The, the most special thing about being married to me is gaining a witness to your life like that that's the that's the Mm. special part the the legal part of it is uh, is like protection like all other things I think but like the special part is just having someone who can actually be a a witness and a testament to your life and I mean that's what I have right I I just have someone very special who can who can just testify to all the, the things that I have done and gone through but um, I think just the idea of commitment, committing to anything, because commitment is hard, right? But we're right. we're making a commitment to two people who are not necessarily even vowing to stay in love, but vowing to respect each other. And um, that's the part of marriage that like excites me is like the respect aspect. Like you could love a lot of people, but can't, how long can you respect them when they piss you off? <laughs> Amen. So one of the things, you know, especially as a wedding photographer, I'm going to start talking about the not right? That's that's goals for anyone in the wedding industry to not only even be in the publication, but you ended up on the cover. You are on the current cover of The Knot. Um, so for those that don't know, it's one of the largest wedding publications. What has this experience been like for you? And how did it come about? How did you get this opportunity? Um, I don't think that I ever considered that being as authentic as I have been in my why, like my reason behind creating Pintor and why I do it the way that I do would ever allot me the opportunity to end up on the cover of a magazine. Um, And that's basically what happened during, I would like to say around May, June, July, a lot of publications were reaching out um, specifically for black designers wanting to make sure that our talent was was being seen and there was a call for that right and Mm -hmm. um, I did I ended up speaking to one of the editors for a quick blurb in like the magazine about the brand and a lot of other designers did the same and I I tried to make it a point not just to to offer the quick blurb about who Pantor is and what we do but I really wanted them to understand the journey and the story and I ended up writing just a couple more sentences like I really just want you to understand like what Pantor has looked like and why it's so important to black women Mm -hmm. and um, I didn't know that that would have manifested into a magazine cover (laughs) so a couple months later that same editor reached out and she was just like I was just really really inspired by you sharing your journey with me and we would love to have you on the cover of the night and I read that email and I was just like "Mm -mm." I I I read it I I closed the computer because I just felt like I wasn't reading it right and I had a long day I was just like okay they want to pull a dress for the cover got it closed the computer and then I went back to it and I was like shut up it was a lot of tears um a lot of tears. There were so there were 
so many tears. The best friend that I told you I hired, um, she works freelance for us now, but she was one of the first people I called and she was hysterical. Like she, out of uh, so many people, she understands what like this journey has looked like for me, the ups, the downs, the good, the bad, the ugly of it all. And um, it was definitely cry worthy. It was an emotional day. Um, even shooting the cover, getting up to that point, wow. like it, it was a lot. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but what I, what I want to make sure that other entrepreneurs understand is that people generally find you doing good work. And either my leak or lovey said this to me, like people find you doing good work. So, mm-hmm. it's, and I, and I say that to say that the knot didn't find me. And then I started to do good work. They found me already doing it. And right. It, it, and that's the part of like getting props and publicity that I think we need to understand because sometimes we kind of force our time. And I know I have, I've been in that position. Like I want to be doing this. I want to be seen for doing this, but I was just like, you got to actually do the work, sis. <laughs> Get busy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm currently scrolling through your Instagram page once again and just breathtaking images. Is I mean, not only are you the designer, you also the model, honey. Like, don't get it twisted. Y'all better go on that Instagram page and see. <laughs> Andrea, it's working with. She's working it. I mean, the knot is huge. That's a, that's a huge accomplishment to be on the cover of the knot. And and you know, I see essence. I see Muna Lucci, big. Yeah. yeah. Like, do you have a favorite shoot that you've done in the past? no they're all really really special I would honestly say that my favorite shoots are the ones that we do independently for our collection because it's just a culmination of like what the year Mm. has been and that's why we named them like the collections have been named storm because I was going through a hell of a year and (laughs) we've had one called flight because I just knew we were about to take off and the current one is the the current one is called journey because I just know that this is about to be epic and you know like it's just that's what it's been the first one that we like officially named was called boundless and that was our 2017 collection that we released in 2016 and I just knew that like I was boundless that Pantor was boundless and like we could do anything you could Mm -hmm. not you know could it not pigeonhole us and the next year was fearless and I was pregnant and I was like I'm scared but I gotta do this anyway the following one is uh storm and that one I uh I was just like all right I'm, I'm going through it all. We had just legitimately moved from that 400 square foot space to a 3000 square foot space. And I was just like, we're going to figure this out. We're here. We're going to figure it out. And then the next one was flight. That's when I said, like, I know <laughs> this, is, this is our year. 2020 was our year. That's what I said. Like 2020 was everybody's year. <laughs> Man- manifest it. I mean, we saw what happened, but at the same time, I mean, we, we made it through and, and you manifested all of this. I love the fact that you, you know, took these strong words, one word, and just made it the theme for each shoot and each uh, con- concept that you came up with. Yeah. And it's also the year for, it's like the word for my team as well. Like they understand like what we go through collectively. Um, I'm very grateful to have just a dynamic group of women behind the brand who really understand the vision that I have for Pantor, especially because I don't necessarily play, I don't play the same role that I did seven years ago. So I'm just really grateful that there's people to really expand on what it is that I created and understand why the collection is named what it is and to kind of also interpret that for what it means to them. And that's why those like single words are so important and like what we mm-hmm. name the dresses. We, we name the dresses after really strong people. We have like Coretta. <laughs> we have mm-hmm. Felicia. We like, you know, we, we really try to, to honor our journey. Yeah. Of it so yeah just let's focus on motherhood right now you're a wife you are a business owner you're also a mother like how do you balance that all first and foremost let me just get the first part of the question how are you balancing motherhood throughout all of this (laughs) I love an honest girl I do yeah I'm not either yeah Yeah. let's talk about it I'm not I'm not (laughs) you know what there's some times where I just can't, but I just try to make sure I'm not missing anything important and I'm doing the absolute best thing I can for him. Um, And I try to make sure that I'm doing the best thing I can for me because unhappy me is going to be an unhappy kid. Right. You know, 
I do the best that I can. And so what I've learned about balance is it's not necessarily giving everything uh, equal time. It's about giving 100% of yourself when you're there. So when I am Mm -hmm. with him and I'm present, I am 100% present. Yeah. you know, and anything else, if I've said I can give 50% of my time to this thing, I give 100% during that 50% of my time. So it's it's not necessarily, you know, I don't know that I've, I don't have balance. Some of these balls drop. Yeah. <laughs> so, drop. We're human. It, yeah. it happens, especially with motherhood. And do you, do you have mom guilt moments at times? I really, I really want our, our listeners who are, entrepreneurs and mothers to 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 have something to relate to and understand like mom guilt happens to all of us so are there mom guilt moments that happen that you kind of have to talk yourself off of the ledge and say yo you're doing the best you can I probably had more work guilt than I had mom guilt to be honest really yeah when I had a Kenne I had a c-section and I went back to work that same week um (sighs) Yeah. And I realized that was not sustainable. It wasn't a good idea. And I was not setting, um, I was not setting a good impression. I wasn't making a good impression to my team by telling them that I wasn't even worth taking a few days off after having Mm. a baby. And, um, you know, I, I can't say that I experienced mom guilt, but I can also say that I got into therapy in good timing. (laughs) But I've only experienced mom guilt like one solid time. And that was a Halloween where I did not buy a costume. And I was just like, I don't even know how I managed to miss. I didn't even realize it was Halloween. And here I am with a big ass llama taking all the, um, the, the filling out of the llama so I could stuff my kid in it. And just so he could have a Halloween picture 10 years from now. So I could tell him he was something for Halloween. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. Because a lot of the stories that we do have of, of mom guilt I've had stories where like I was like oh my god I missed this one show where Ava would perform and yeah she don't even remember that show yeah she didn't care to be in it (laughs) you know what I have to tell you I realized something about my kid and I don't know if it's true to all kids but like there was a point where I dropped into my mom's house and Kenny closed the door and told me to leave and I was just like you know what you're gonna stop you're gonna stop doing this to yourself like you are not gonna feel bad that you can't have him on your hip when you're working you are just gonna go to work and pick him up when work is done because you are fine and obviously so is he and I just, the guilt thing, the guilt thing, I mean, there's moments where I'm just like, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. But honestly, I am doing the best that I can with what I have. And when I have more, I give him more. And when I don't, I just don't have it. And I think that's, that's like all we can do. Amen. You you did mention therapy. And I think more and more people are starting to be more open about just going to see a therapist and getting those sessions in. So what did you get out of therapy? Um, way more than I bargained for. Cause honestly, like this is expensive, um, but, uh, you know what, yes, the, thing, the thing about therapy is you go in thinking you're going to fix this one thing. And then you realize that you have more work to do than you, than you went in thinking you did. So like I went in because work was stressing me out. And then I realized that there were areas of my life that I needed improvement. And then there were things that were going unaddressed because I just didn't think that they were a priority to me. But then I realized that they were interfering in, with other areas mm-hmm. of my life and how I didn't have boundaries. <laughs> I didn't have any clear cut boundaries. I would, I wouldn't even say that I let people disrespect me, but I did not set boundaries where I, I just stopped things that I didn't like. And, you know, now I kind of understand better how to set those ban- boundaries and even, even to s- state what they are and say, you know what, I'm sorry, but this is just a boundary that I have. Um, and just being able to speak up for myself and, and say that, you know what, there was something really special about therapy. It was this one point that my, that my therapist was just like, you know, what, Andrea, you're having a hard time accepting the fact that you paid these dues and now you get to enjoy it because you're still working mm. like you did seven years ago. But guess what? You're not where you were seven years ago. Right, right. <laughs> and I was just like, whoa. <laughs> like, I was like, who, who knew? Like, I didn't know how to put that into words where I didn't have to grind the way that I was going. Like, I didn't even, I didn't even know how to to come to that conclusion someone else had to give me permission to to not work so hard i've i've done the therapy work too so it's it's great to have somebody else literally tell you what you can't see because you're living in it hey you 
take a break. Yeah. You, 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 you've done the work. If you could relay a message to your younger self, because this is, this is definitely something that I enjoy doing in my downtime of self-reflection. If you could relay a message to your younger self coming up in the industry, what would that be? The, now that you know what you needed to do in terms of, you know, taking that time out for yourself, like what, what, what message would you send your younger self? Hmm, that's a good question. I, it's funny. I, I talked to my younger self like yesterday. Cause I was just like, I would tell my younger self that I made good on my promises. Like I know that I told old girl when she was 12 that you go, you will be fine. You'll be everything. You'll be gorgeous. You'll be smart. You'll mm -hmm. be decisive. You'll be all of these things. And I would love to tell my, my 12 year old and 15 year old self that like everything that you have done will will have manifested itself and you are you are worth all of the things especially as a 17 year old because like at 17 I didn't know how much I was worth and I mm -hmm. think that like I, I think that I'd probably tell tell my younger self how much I am worth and like that I, like I'm just complete gold yeah 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 I think that's dope and it's probably going to be a lot of younger Andrea Pitters that are going to listen in right so on on a on a lighter note too i wanted to ask we're gonna go into some rapid fire right now oh gosh <laughs> here we go it's not too bad don't who's worry about it the, who's in your music playlist right now coffee scarface coffee 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 oh, oh yeah. I, heard, I heard coffee for a second coffee no, okay i'm co i'm coffee everything right now oh yeah she, like she's on yeah. yeah, love coffee, love her message. Yeah. Um, what shows are you binge watching right now? I just did Bridgerton and mm. um I did this Michael Costello uh fashion thing on Amazon. Like I, I binge watched that just I haven't Bridgerton. watched that one yet. Yeah, it, it seems to be really good and good trouble. I have to like I think it's season three, good trouble on freeform. That's what I'm binge watching right now. How did you feel about Bridgerton in terms of fashion? Because I feel like they really. I I feel like they they made it more accessible than it probably was. But I felt good about the clothing. Like I, I yeah. always love strong costume direction and I don't feel like there were ever any holes in yeah. the costume. That's direction. how I felt too. Yeah. But I, I felt like they definitely made it uh not more accessible, but just something that people could see in like relate to more now like I can see Bridgerton becoming like a trend in fashion like that that whole yeah. concept mm -hmm. I can see it re-emerging yeah it felt it felt relatable it, it definitely did because when I saw it I'm just like okay yeah I love that there's it's, I love peace periods first and foremost yeah. so when I saw it I'm just like okay I can see somebody trying to recreate this it, it is and, and be, being able to right yeah that's what I love and still be yeah, because you yeah. you could break down his like the looks. Mm -hmm. I'm saying his. We know who he is, but um, you could break down the looks and like I could see like you know the jackets paired with like some slacks. Like it, it was. A, I think it was a vibe. It was good. Huh, nice. Now I'm curious to know which celebrity are you waiting to see get engaged so you can put them in one of your pieces. Oh. I I love relatable women. Um, huh? Who am I waiting on to get engaged? That's hard. I I I'm not in these celebrities business, but Lori, you know what? I'm I'm a stand for Lori. Lori. I'm standing. Oh, there you go. I was waiting. Yes. <laughs> I'm <standing> Lori. <laughs> I want I want to see that girl kill it. Yes, she, you that's, know she's gonna she gonna have a fashion moment. That's that's who I want my eyes on, Lori. So you know, haters will say uh, wedding dresses are so expensive, it's a waste of money. Especially marriage means nothing nowadays, or whatever. So you know, honestly, what are your thoughts on spending, investing in a wedding dress, and how how would you explain the worth? I am not one to put myself in other people's pockets because a wedding mm. dress is what you make it. You can buy a dress from anywhere and wear it on your wedding day and it would be a wedding dress. 
um, wedding dresses at Pantora are tied to the experience. Yeah. It's not just necessarily the dress that you're buying. Um, but I, honestly, like the word, first of all, I have spent 16 years of my life manifesting what Pantora is today. So somebody has to pay for that. <laughs> um, but also, but also, um, there's so much staff and so much work that goes behind just dropping a collection. We're talking about photo shoots. We're talking about that good old expensive Brooklyn rent. We're talking about right. all mm -hmm. of the things that it, that are required to be a sustainable business. And so, um, you know, I will never tell you what your pockets could afford or tell you what to buy and how to spend your money. But if you find value in your wedding dress and your wedding dress experience, then you'll, de you'll determine like how much money you're willing to spend. Um, there are brides who, who want to spend quite a bit and there are some that don't want to spend any at all. But I think it's just a matter of where your priorities lie. Mm -hmm. I told people to cut mm -hmm. people off their guest list quick, fast. Like if you don't, you don't need that second, third, fourth cousin at your wedding. Buy the dress that you want. Yeah. <laughs> just invite less people. I hear that. Those yeah. pictures last forever. Right, Those too. moments last forever. The, the the experience lasts forever. So you really got to prioritize yeah. what you want that day to be. It's all about uh you know, the priority of it all. Like, what is the most important thing to you? I, I know people who the dress is just not that important, but honestly, I want people to spend their money on photography. Like, <laughs> like spend your money with a, a good photographer. That is where I want everyone to spend their money on. Yeah. There, there you go. I mean, I'm going to bring it right to my experience with Pantora um, as a member of the Munaluchi Coterie. Um, one of my brides, Diane Lucas, she actually went Pantora, right? And for me that moment where I finally, as a photographer, got a publication. I was in, in the, um, that Munaluchi. So to get that feature, I think it was real special. So I got to shout you out for that. And I think that all the future brides that are listening, you get, you get a Pantora um, dress, you, you might get featured somewhere, right? I think that's when, <laughs> that's one thing I've seen. Honestly, like it, it's not always just about even the, the dress purchase. I always tell people, you may come to Pantor and not find your dream gown, but I do hope you find your dream experience. Like that's yeah. really what it's about. Like right. Pantor is about celebrating women. The the dresses are legitimately the cherry on top. And that's what that's what keeps us in business, people's purchases. But um that experience, when you have a Pantor experience, you get to tell people about it. And you know, that's what kind of keeps our doors open. Like Pantor is it is a special place. I don't even know if I fully have the words to describe what Pantor is, but it is unlike anything any other bridal experience and I know that because I have staff who have worked in other uh luxury bridal boutiques um I've worked in other uh, uh you know for other bridal brands and I just know that what we've created is something really really special and if you can't buy the dress they'll make an appointment we're not mad at you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have I have I have one last question because it almost slipped my mind and I'm so glad my brain was like oh how did the blue ivy birthday moment happened what what was the story behind that i created a story in my head around it because do you know years prior the vmas or grammys one of the two blue ivy was like going viral and everyone it was a picture of a gold dress and everyone thought that it was blue ivy it was my niece for my wedding day and it was on vogue.com ybf oh, in style wow. it was everywhere it was it was a PR dream and nightmare at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thought it was Blue Ivy. I mean, people were contacting us left and right. And I remember writing Zarina like, ha, ha, funny. <laughs> Zarina's Beyonce stylist. And I was like, isn't, isn't this funny? And I was like, I don't think she thinks this is funny at all. <laughs> but but um, we had made the connection and I had sent Blue... I, I always send blue clothes. And so I didn't even know that blue had worn that piece for her birthday until Beyonce dropped those photos eight months later. Oh, so wow. When everybody else found out is when we found out too. I think one of my employees sent it to me like, hey, this looks like ours. And I was like, it sure is. It sure wow. is. Yeah. Oh, well, Beyonce, she's a sneaky one. <laughs> yeah, Love she it. is. But, you know, I look forward to to some more uh, of our niece blue wearing, wearing Pantora. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this amazing interview. So much insight, so Thanks. much gems.
it was such a pleasure sitting down with Andrea. And just to remind you guys, subscribe, leave a rating, leave a comment or a five if you want to. Show some love, share some love. Uh, we appreciate you and it goes a long way. Thank you again for tuning into Blue Dope. Until next time.